Welcome to So Very Wrong About Games. This is a board gaming podcast about board games. We're very serious here. Super serious. Super serious. We're going to talk about the games we played this week. We're going to talk about the news and why it totally doesn't matter. And then we're going to talk about our main game of the week, which is Zoo Vadis by Reiner Knizia. Mark, you are my co-host here. Yes. We will now talk about the games we played this week. <laughs> Go. This is a new sort of regimented <laughs> militarism, a form of discipline that I was unprepared for, given that, once again, this is a podcast owned and operated by Gibbons. So, I continued the campaign of Undaunted Stalingrad by Trevor Benjamin and David Thompson. This, of course, is the campaign version of Undaunted. Any Undaunted is good Undaunted, but one of the things that I frequently comment in the context of the Undaunted series is that many of the World War II versions, some of the scenarios can feel a bit lopsided and or a little more scripted than I would like. Now, that having been said, the system is so brilliantly done that I'm happy to play even the ones where one side is relatively static and or one of the sides seems to have a much, much tougher road to hoe. But I have to say that I was very impressed with uh, one of the two scenarios that I played this week. One of them was fine. The other one was among the best Undaunted scenarios that I've ever played in terms of dynamism and a genuine sense of back and forth and a genuine tension right up into the end about who is going to be able to fulfill the victory conditions first. And I don't know if that was a fluke of the setup. I don't know if it was a fluke of, of various decisions we've made. I don't know if we had reached that route in the campaign via different methods if it would have been as satisfying, uh, but I don't really care. We have now reached the point in the campaign where we are terraforming Stalingrad, namely some buildings are getting destroyed and or degraded, some are getting additionally fortified, and so there's a, a, a better sense of, of scale and space. I mean, the campaign starts with Pavlov's house, which is a, a relatively famous landmark for anyone familiar with that stage of World War II. Uh, nothing has happened to it yet. Uh, other than the fact that in our version, the Germans uh, control it. It was never taken back by Pavlov. And ultimately, he died attempting to take Pavlov's house back. And so there's there's a joke somewhere in the campaign about how maybe they'll call it Otto's house now. Anyway. And I'm thoroughly enjoying, enjoying Undaunted Stalingrad. Now, again, there's the three World War II Undaunted games. Uh, and then there's on top of that, the Battle of Britain and the Battle of Britain is definitely the most different of all the Undaunted games. And who knows whether next year's science fiction offering will change that. Uh, but ultimately I do enjoy the variety. I, I'm hard pressed to, to decide which of the land based World War II ones I prefer, because again, the whole campaign structure is very minimalist. It's not particularly intrusive. There's not a whole heck of a lot of upkeep. But that it is a campaign doesn't provide a tremendous value-added proposition to me, uh, other than the fact that the box is much, much larger and has a lot more terrain tokens. But as I say, seeing the city evolve, if anything, is perhaps more satisfying than seeing my squad evolve, especially since a lot of the consequences of casualties can seem a little bit arbitrary. Like, for example, when you start receiving better units... Uh, advanced units that have capabilities that your basic units don't start with. And these are units that are very, very parallel to Undaunted Normandy that you'll, you'll see in later scenarios. There's some possibility that their library is going to go from three available cards down to two for the rest of the campaign. And that is a huge hit. Now, fortunately, in the campaign that I'm playing, those kinds of serious detriments have been relatively evenly spread out. Both my opponent and I have been in a position of losing some of our elite troops. But if it was the case that one side were routinely losing them, or if one side was down to one of their elite units down to having a single card left, that's brutal. And I'd feel very, very uncomfortable about things. Now, that having been said, the scenario design does a reasonably good job of compensating. I mean, again, Trevor Benjamin and David Thompson know what they're doing. So a given elite unit might be introduced in a scenario, and in that first scenario in which they're introduced, they might be the ones responsible for the victory condition. You know, they might be responsible for doing a task, and that's the victory condition, and no one else can do that task. But then I have not yet seen, maybe more scenarios down the road, I will see it. I've not yet seen those same units having to fulfill the victory condition in the same way. So therefore, I think they're trying to minimize the pain of having a reduced elite unit in that sense. But at any rate, 
we are massive fans of the Undaunted system. It is such a well-done card game. And we are also fans of seeing how deck building can evolve and pull different designs in different ways. As a fundamental engine to drive things, it can be done for a simple action efficiency slash economic game, a la Dominion and a la a whole bunch of other uh, also rands in that space, which I'm happy to play, even though they're also rands all the way to slightly more sophisticated and or elaborate designs like Undaunted, like even Mage Knight. I'm saying Undaunted is basically Mage Knight. So that's Undaunted Stalingrad by Trevor Benjamin and David Thompson. This was the Undaunted release of last year by Osprey Games, as opposed to the Undaunted release of this year, and as opposed to the Undaunted release of next year. Please slow down. There's only so much shelf space. (laughs) There's only so much time. There's only so much shelf space. And that is Undaunted Stalingrad. You and I got to play a couple games of Voidfall. This is designed by Nigel Buckle and David Turtsey and put out by Mind Clash Games. So this is a science fiction game. It's very much like a sort of anime story, right? This, this you know, omni-power came and visited a certain race and it bestowed upon them the ultimate power that will save the universe. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> no, they're actually just wanted to take them over and now I'm using them for, to, so they can take over the universe. And now we all have to fight back. So there's tons of different races. An interesting sort of ship introduction. Usually all everyone has standard ships unless one of the races has a technology for a fancy ship, then it's sort of available for everyone. And what you're doing is you're sort of, I don't even want to know what to say. There's a bunch of, a bunch of these agenda. I guess the government is sort of issuing these sort of proclamations, and in in the form of agendas, and you have to take these. No, agendas. I, I take it more as as your given people decide to focus on something internally. I mean, there is no government left. The government fell, gotcha. as you say. The the parasitic transdimensional hive mind, namely the Voidborn. Uh, have done done their dirty business with the previous powers that be, and now we're all scrambling in the ashes. So we take these agendas, and we're trying to so, so sort of you're trying to fulfill all these different, you know, point generating systems. And to do this, you're like populating systems, you're getting technology, you're putting out these guilds, and all of this is sort of generating yourself an engine. And to fuel this engine, you are playing cards. And you have a hand of nine different cards that you're going to choose from, and they do all sorts of different things. And I really had a f- sort of a feeling of scythe in a way, because I really wanted to do this thing. But to do this optimally, I really need to do this card first. But I can't do this card until I get this resource. So in order to get that resource, I'm going to have to play this other card. So you like you line up this three card combo, and then halfway through that particular turn, you finally get to do what you want to do. And then you realize you probably should have just done the thing inefficiently in the first place anyway, because now the round's almost over. Just so. And that's the very interesting part about... Uh, Voidfall. Voidfall is the, how many turns, because there is an event at the beginning of every turn, and it will give you minimal goals to go for, but it will also tell you how many cards you get to play that round. I thought that was very interesting. Mark, what do you think of Voidfall as in general? So before I start talking about the game, I'd like to talk about the way the information is presented in Voidfall, because I think it's a question of a series of good decisions and a series of bad decisions. Let me start with the good decisions. The iconography is extensive. And despite many of my previous complaints about iconography in games in general, and games illustrated by Eno Tool in particular, I think the iconography in Voidfall is done exceptionally well. It is so well done that halfway through a rules explanation, people will start picking up what the icons mean, and before you explain how a given action card works, they will tell you what they think it works, and they're probably going to be right. That, I think, is no mean feat. When I initially saw the summary of icons which is something, by the way, that we never refer to, I was very afraid. And I looked at the action cards. There's text on the action cards, but they're purely descriptive. There's no actual element of explaining what they do on the cards. But this is not a problem. It doesn't... It's it's a, it's not a problem even by the end of the rules explanation, broadly speaking. There's also a glossary, and the glossary contains an exhaustive account of almost every element in the game of Voidfall. It's not like one of those things that you see in a lot of other games where there's a sort of iconographic key that says, well, this means it costs you one energy. And then every other instance of it costing one energy is not mentioned in the glossary. No, no, no. They went through and they 
repeated over and over and over again. This means it costs one energy. This means it costs one science. This means it costs one credit, so forth. So you never have to cross-reference anything, which I think is great. Everything is where you would expect it to be. The organization is very, very well done. And so it's almost trivial. Granted, you have to look it through the book, but any weird technology that comes up, any strange event that transpires, any agenda that pops up, you'll know where to find it and you'll get a good plain English explanation about what the card does in its totality. That, I think, is exceptional. I, in fact, printed up a second copy so that both sides of the table could do those things. That part is great. There's only one minor exception. They, they, don't, uh, they don't do that with respect to the combat capabilities of the advanced ships. So, for example, instead of actually telling you what destroyers do, in the destroyer entry of the technology, it says, this lets you build destroyers. Period. It's like, great. Thanks. Yeah. I appreciate that. Then there's the rulebook which I think does one of the best jobs of intimidating and convincing the reader that they're not able to play this game that I've seen in a while. Because if you open up to almost any random spread, you're going to see the highlighted paragraphs that only apply to the competitive game, the highlighted paragraphs that only apply to the cooperative game, the highlighted paragraphs that don't apply to the tutorial, more on that later, the highlighted paragraphs that apply in the tutorial, but only in round two going forward. And at this point, I, it, it seems like a mess. But it's not. Fundamentally, I, I'm just going to echo something that Efka from No Pun Included said. Voidfall fundamentally is shockingly simple, given how much is actually going on. You play an action card, you do a couple actions, you try to satisfy the victory conditions that you have been building towards. It's a build-your-own-recipe, build-your-own-engine not quite point salad because you've already been to the salad bar and you've decided what kind of salad you want, and so you're building your salad to spec. This, this metaphor has gotten out of hand. Yes. Let us retire it. <laughs> but, dessert, dessert bar is better anyway. Who, <laughs> you, you don't make friends with salad bar. Fair enough, but you understand what I'm getting at. I do. And you have to work towards getting your point engine together as well as determining what satisfies your point engine. The tutorial is a strange beast. You have not played the tutorial, Walker. What are your thoughts about your first play in terms of the information onboarding after having played it the first time? It's it's a lot. Yep. There, like I said, there are nine cards that all have fairly unique actions. A lot of them are intermixed. There are three main sections to each card, and you're going to do two of them unless you, know, you do other things. You can do all three. And then there is a wider range of text that you sort of have to internalize. And then like we already talked about, there is also like four to five different agendas that you really need to look at. So you can sort of start building towards something. Do you wish you had played something resembling a tutorial? No. Okay. I'll say the following. I'm of two minds with respect to the tutorial because the tutorial, it is kind of a full game. The way they recommend you play it, I think is garbage. The, the way they recommend it is they say, okay, set everything up. Learn how to play cycle one. There are three cycles in a game of Voidfall. After you're finished cycle one, read all the cycle two rules, which are scattered throughout the rule book. Explain it to everybody else at the table and then finish the game. This, I do not think, is apt to lead to a good experience. This is, this is in fact, I positively recommend that you do not teach Voidfall this way. I played the tutorial with Huey before playing with you for the first time, and that was my first full game of Voidfall. I'm glad I did it that way. Here's the thing. I think the rules explainer would benefit from having experienced the tutorial, but I'm not sure that anybody else needs to. No, like ha having to make someone else sit through it, I don't think is a good idea. But sitting there and working through the game yourself using the tutorial so you can teach it better, probably a good idea. Yes. I think I probably would have been able to derive about 90 to 95% of the value just by setting it up pulling a couple levers, not actually playing the solo game, because we have not played the solo or cooperative game, because the solo or cooperative game lords on another board, another set of cards that drives another set of cards. It's more or less the competitive game, but you are expected to jump through more hoops in the process of scoring your points, largely speaking. So it doesn't really hold a lot of appeal to me, despite the fact that the theme of Voidfall lends itself more to a cooperative experience anyway. You, you, you basically explain the thrust of the game and people understand. So we're all fighting against the Voidborn. It's like, yeah, but, you know, we're selfish jerks, so we're going to try to get our yeah. piece of the pie too. Yeah, like always, oh, just like most every apocalyptic game, it's like everything's going to hell. Can we work together? No, why would we do that? That's <laughs> dumb. Yeah, the explanation in in-game universe isn't quite that arbitrary. The idea is that we're all like semi-feudal houses anyway, like, you know, Twilight, Twilight Imperium stuff. So... 
as I say, having gone through the tutorial, I think it made me able to explain the game better. And the tutorial is kind of a game, but just as an example, in the tutorial, the event deck is stacked and the event at the top of round one is discard all but three action cards. And there are three rounds in that round. And <laughs> indeed, when I first read the, the event card to Huey, he's like, well, this is a tutorial, all right? So it's basically play these three cards in any order. That part is a little more hand-holding than I think is strictly necessary because I think you'll get as much playing one of the earlier, easier scenarios badly than even by playing the tutorial. And on the topic of scenarios, there are a lot. Yeah, and they sort of manipulate how the game is played because one of the main uh, detriments I feel so far is that it's a very heads down game. Yes. You have, instead of having resources, you have dials for all your resources. So you can't really tell how, how many resources people are getting and sort of like gauge how you are doing or gauge how they're getting resources and sort of change your strategy that way. They also have dials for victory points. So you can't really see how many victory, well, you know, you can just look over and ask someone. Right. But in normal it's not games, the same. yeah, it's not the same as just looking at the board and saying, you know, well, I'm halfway behind, but you know what I'm saying. And there's enough, I shouldn't say there's enough technologies for everyone, but very seldom are there technologies taken that you wanted. You know what I mean? There's usually, yeah. there's two for a three-player well, game. And, and, and if someone took so the bad. one you wanted, you can probably take one that'll get you somewhere similar or some other kind of efficiency. The one area where I do feel a lot of competition in Voidfall is for trade goods. Trade goods disappear real quick. Because trade goods are great. <laughs> they get they let you do all manner of things. Sometimes they give you points because you have an agenda that, that rewards them. But generally, they reduce your upkeep costs, and they can be cashed in for bennies. So, uh, and there's never enough. Yeah, so we got off track because we're talking about the different scenarios. No tracks in space. No tracks in space. And so the scenarios we've played so far have, have started us a little further away from each other. So we haven't really had a combat with another player yet. It's true. And, and so some scenarios... I'm hoping we'll change that up a little. So we'll see. Oh, if you want to play... So yeah, they're rated for complexity and they're rated for aggression. Uh, f the first scenario we played was rated one for aggression. And I, as we commented, I, it would have been borderline impossible for us to pick a fight with somebody else even if we had tried. And the second scenario we played was rated two for aggression. And there were circumstances in which we were bordering each other and we could have even successfully attacked each other. I think the specific comment I made with respect to Huey and myself was that we could go big game hunting, but it wasn't in our interest to do so point-wise. So, like, for example, I had an agenda that said you're going to get four points per sector where you have two or more military presence. Well, I could conquer another sector, but then I would have two sectors with less military presence, and then I wouldn't score those things, so why bother, effectively, was, was the upshot. Now... If it had been a more aggressive game, I probably wouldn't have drafted that agenda in the first place. But I agree with your prior comment. Voidfall is exceptionally heads down. Typically, the only point of contact is looking over to see how few trade goods are left. Uh, occasionally, the technology you want gets snaked by somebody else. But mostly, at the end of each of the three rounds, people declare how many victory points you got. You look over and say, oh, good job. How'd you do that? And then someone's like, well, I have this agenda. It's like, great. Good for you. <laughs> Which is Okay. It's not uh, it's not ideal, but quite frankly, uh, it it's one way to avoid some of the multiplayer conflict game problems. I don't know how it's going to shake out in context of higher aggression, but if your inclination is to play the next scenario with more aggression, I'm certainly happy to do that. And then there's sort of like the only other detriment I had to it was sort of a couple little tacked on sort of like lucidity type. Here's another step you have to do that. They had a whole step of sort of skirmish attacks from the Voidfall. Voidborn, yeah. Voidborn. And never once, you know, once maybe we lost a ship, but it was never really anything. It took up time. That's true. And was seemed to be tacked on and, and was unnecessary. I'm of two minds. I agree with you that it never felt consequential in terms of output, but I think in terms of guiding our decisions, it was very consequential because it guided how and why we would leave military forces behind. I think the idea and I think it's successful, was that the design decision was to prevent you from just having this front, uh, a heavily fortified front, and then completely ignoring and minimally garrisoning everything behind you. Sure, I, I agree with both these points have, have design reasons. Like the other one is the fact that these agendas that get you points, you have to do an action to to 
to draw it and then you have to play yet another action to put it out. And I just think, you know, that's yet another step. Why don't you get just one card, you well, get it and you put it out. There are many reasons. I'm not that sure I that I'm of. not sure that's accurate. It, it doesn't cost you an action to put them out. You put them out for free and you get a bonus action in the consequence. They just have to be tied to a specific focus. True. So it forces you to pay a certain card. Right. But that, that, I think, is just grist for trade-offs in terms of what action you want to play, as opposed to another administrative step that you have to do. True. And I can see why they needed to do it, because if if you could if you could play an agenda in the same turn, like the very last turn of the round, I think it would lead to very odd circumstances. Yeah. I, I, I don't think they could have made that change trivially. They would have had to change a couple of other things. So here, here's where I'm sitting with Voidfall, ultimately. I was very pleased at both d- the duration and the pacing of Voidfall, because it is a relatively rules-dense game, despite the fact that it is relatively straightforward in terms of pursuing victory conditions. And I was not prepared for it to be so heads down, and yet for it to flow that smoothly. For a multiplayer solitaire Euro, where there's a lot of variables at play, the flow is impressive. It's certainly not, it doesn't flow nearly as well as, say, you know, Scythe, for example, which can whip around at a good rate. But even if you compare it to other Mind Clash games, for example, and certainly if you want to compare it to some Splatters or some Lacertas, you know, when once we start pushing past medium heavy and start getting into heavy, uh, be they Euros or anything else... Uh, I was very, very surprised that Voidfall flowed as well as it did. So it also has a fair amount of flavor, given how Euro it is. The different player factions play very differently. I was very surprised at the different texture that the scenarios offered, because typically the scenarios have uh, just different technologies on offer, slightly different maps, and maybe one or two special sectors added into the mix. And I was very pleased to see that they felt very different and different challenges. On top of the special abilities of each faction, you also have a choice as well. Uh, There are two technologies for every faction, and so when you choose the technology you're going to start with, it also changes sort of your starting setup as well. Right, your your selected origin. And the the specific economic hurdles that I faced as uh, the the two last factions that I played, I was very, very impressed by the variety. And ultimately, uh, the one serious criticism I have of Voidfall uh, is that it is yet another very expensive, very, very large box (laughs) game. I have the deluxe version with the plastic spaceships because I am very weak to plastic spaceships. I make no apologies. They could be repurposed for use in other tabletop miniatures games, and I might indeed seek to do that because you end up with a huge quantity, far more than you need. I will, however, point out that if you're inclined to play Voidfall, if you have a copy of Voidfall, there are trays for each of the player factions, and they are unlabeled, and this is unforgivable. There are excellent sticker sheets that have been posted on BoardGameGeek. Take your pick. They just need to be labeled. You need to know which faction is in which label. It is 100% necessary. And the setup is considerable. Tear down is much faster, especially if many people are participating. You can tear it down in, in 10 minutes. But the setup, it takes me about half hour doing it alone. Uh, and I could probably get it faster if, if multiple people were around to help me. But I don't know any helpful people, so I wouldn't know anything about that. That's true. I'm really surprised at how much I enjoy Voidfall, to be frank, because David Certe has been hit or miss for me in terms of his designs. Uh, Nigel Buckle, though, Nigel Buckle and David Certe, I've basically played two designs by them. One of them is Imperium the Civ deck building game, which I love. And now there's Voidfall, which so far I'm three games in. And this is a heavy game. I played three times in a week. And I I never felt it drag. I never felt like it was burdensome. I've taught it to a whole bunch of different uh, people, and, and that didn't feel burdensome either. It's really quite an accomplishment in a number of ways. Yeah. That having been said, still very heads down, still very expensive. Yeah, I love how the, it, it sort of grows. You get more systems. You get more production. But you never even seem to be able to run that production. <laughs> right? You always seem to yeah. be doing something else. It's like, well, I really should take a production turn and get my resources up. But I'd rather get rid of this corruption because you have this corruption constantly coming in. That's going to mess up most of your scoring opportunities because a lot of the scoring opportunities says with no, all of them pretty with, much. Yeah. With no it, corruption. It, you, do, you do not score things that are corrupted as a rule. And then you have your own player board that has tracks that give you abilities. So you're sort of a little bit of comboing going on because you know, you go up the track, it gives you another action, all sorts of interesting things. I want to play more Voidfall. 
And j- just to highlight one more thing in terms of, you, you mentioned something about production. I think this is one of the areas in which Voidfall makes a number of clever decisions because the, uh, the, the fundamental round structure, this is one of the reasons why the flow is so good. The fundamental round structure is pretty brisk. And one piece of evidence towards that is there is no production phase. If you want to produce food, you have to do an action to produce food. If you want to produce minerals, energy, science, whatever, you have to do an action that does that. There's no part of the round where everything produces for free. You want to deploy military forces, you got to take the action to do it. And so ultimately, that, that gives you a sense of, of, of freedom and burden, but a good kind of burden, the pleasant kind of trade-off burden that Voidfall trades in so well. I think, look, if you like heavy heads down Euros, I think Voidfall is, is an easy recommend uh, if you have access to the very expensive product that it is. I think this is a return to form to Mind Clash. After the disappointment that was Perseverance Castaway Chronicles, I think that Voidfall absolutely is, deserves to, to say next to games like Anachrony and Cerebria, games that we're very, very fond of. And I, I, I came in with relatively low expectations, and I was very, very, very pleasantly surprised. That is Voidfall by Nigel Buckle and David Tertze, by Mind Class Games, fulfilled recently. Got to play Louis the Fourteenth. This is a Rudiger Dorn design from 2005. It was redeveloped as a big box game involving anthropomorphic animal gangsters. And if there's one kind of anthropomorphic animal theme that I'm definitely tired of, it's anthropomorphic animal gangsters. I've seen it a number of times. Don't find gangsters interesting. Don't find anthropomorphic animals interesting. Whatever. And the great thing about Louis XIV is it's what used to be called... This is this is not a kid's these days. This is not back in the day. This is just a historical observation. When it was released in 2005, it was called a medium box game. Now it would be called a small box game. It is roughly the size of the Red Cathedral Walker, for, gotcha. for, for point of reference. But similar to the Red Cathedral, it is indeed a full Euro game. It is an area majority game that is... Uh, very, very Rudiger Dorn-esque. Rudiger Dorn likes to design games where you effectively uh, get to proceed along diagonals and leave little trails behind you. You know, Istanbul, Goa, a number of other designs do that. And Louis the Fourteenth, there are these personalities that are set out in a grid, an offset grid, and you play action cards that let you drop your pieces of influence on them, but then you get to spread to adjacent uh, people and there's a shifting variety of goals that you need to accomplish on these specific personalities. So sometimes it's well, uh, you pay the money to give to get the bunny. Sometimes it's if you have at least two pieces there, you get the bunny. Sometimes it's whoever has the most pieces there gets the bunny, etc. And these change from round to round by flipping the tiles over. I've always really liked Louis the Fourteenth because. In addition to a really solid area majority system, you use these resources to cash in missions, which give you little special powers. And so it's just enough of a spice on top of a relatively straightforward Euro engine that I find it very, very pleasant. Uh, I have a historical story about my life, not about Louis XIV, about Louis, about my experience with the game that I will share later during a review of the feature game. Uh, that is one of the reasons why I haven't really been able to play it a whole heck of a lot in the past few years, because I have uh, very conflicted memories. But I was very pleased to return to Louis the Fourteenth. I, in fact, introduced it to two Louis, so that seemed to make sense. Louis and Louis both enjoyed uh, Louis the Fourteenth, which is very uh, very good to hear, because I'll never forget what Louis said after... This is the second Louis, not the first Louis after he played El Grande for the first time, which says, it's a nice game, I just wish there were more player interaction. Which I think is telling. (laughs) So I was a little bit worried that uh, Area Majority just didn't enter into his brain as something that involved player interaction. But it's very much a quality Euro from right around the turn of the century or thereby. Very simple rules, very quick setup, easy to teach, very approachable, uh, very, very solid gameplay trade-offs. I'm a big fan of Louis the Fourteenth. The only major downside is that with three players, it's a little structurally imbalanced because one player is going to be first twice, and it's an area majority game. You don't want to be first in an area majority game. There are ways that they try to balance it out with intrigue cards, but it, it, it it's a little it's a little less than ideal. But as a as as, as a box that's small and a sprawling huge collection, I'm more than happy to keep it around, and it has just enough trappings of of Louis the Fourteenth ridiculousness. <laughs> People wearing absurd robes, people carrying strange scepters, capes to die for that just go on for days, and velvet, Michael, not velveteen. Ooh. A gentleman knows the difference. Apparently. At any rate, Louis the Fourteenth, 
Rudiger Dorn. I really liked Rudiger Dorn's outfit for, from from that area. This was the first of Alia's medium box game line that then went on to spawn a number of other games, uh, for, like for example, Palazzo by Rudiger Published originally in 2005. So we stream games every Saturday at around noon. This Saturday we played Trailblazers, which Mark, you've already played. I have. And I also got to play a game called Terraforming Mars, the Dice Game. Well, let me tell you, this is published <laughs> by Frix Games and Stronghold here in North America. It plays very much like terraforming mars except you're just sort of rolling dice <laughs> so you're so, so let me get this right so, so it's like terraforming mars but it's a dice game yeah you just, you just don't use resources okay and so it's all about you know first thing like first thing you do is what they call a support action i believe and it's usually grabbing a dice you know making your pool bigger and then you then you, once you roll the dice there's no re-rolling dice Okay. Once you've rolled them, you can turn them to a different phase with some weird actions, but they are few and far between. And then, much like the game, the cards have a certain cost, and you spend those dice, and they go in the pool. So it's not as though you're constantly making this this sort of pool of dice better. It's that you're spending them, and you're just making it bigger type thing. You're trying to replenish your dice over and over again. There are... It's and it plays like I said, much like Terraform Mars. There, you know, you're putting out lakes and increasing the oxygen and increasing the heat, and there are goals that you're trying to go for. The goals are odd because they're taken almost in the very first couple of turns. It's usually, really, yeah, it's usually something you. In the more normal game, you're something you build up to. They, they, the ones we got seem very simple. They were huh. gone in the first two turns. One person didn't get any. It seemed odd. I didn't mind it mostly because of the fact that the flow was real. You simply do those two actions. You do a support action. You do a main action. Next player's turn. Usually a lot of the times it was, okay, for my support action, I take a die. And then one of the main actions was to do another support action, which is usually take a die. Okay, so I take two red dice. You roll them, you put them to the side, and you sort of get ready for your next turn. It's like this card needs, oh, sure. you know, this five dice. And so, you, you know, you're ready for that. And it's like, okay, well, boom, boom, boom. Next you go, you get same, just like Terraforming Mars, you have your blue cards and your green cards and your red cards, and they all do the same, pretty well the same sort of thing. Red cards are instants, blue cards do something constantly. And then there are, there is the sort of the, there's another act, like a whole action you can do besides those two other things. It's sort of like a production turn because much like Terraforming Mars, where you had the production that you sort of built up you can play cards that build up your production. So when you do a production turn, you have to discard down to three cards and down to five dice. And then you look at your production and you gather up all of those dice that you have in your production. You roll those and you, now you have your giant pool. And then on your next turn, you're ready to go again. So it sounds like a lot like Terraforming Mars, but you have dice. But you have dice and okay. it takes a lot less time. It did, it did go longer than I think it should have. About 25% longer is, you know, I got around the 75 point mark. It's like, hey, this should wrap up about now. <laughs> sure. And, but it, it, it continued. And, and a lot of the terraforming Mars, like when I stopped playing the board game, I did play it every so often on the computer game. Sure. And it always, it always did the same thing. You know, you get to that last, it's like, oh, the heat has to go up by two more. And like, it would be a turn <laughs> and then a turn and no one would get like E cards. And then finally it would finish. Yep. So, anyway, so. And it, and lo and behold, this happened also <laughs> in the dice game where it's like, sure. oh, just two more oxygen. Just someone, someone finish this off. So that was terraforming the dice game. I would, I would more than happily, if if it was like uh, for a filler or we're doing a bunch of small games, I'd more than happy play it again. But I would never, you know, choose it as the game of the night. You know what I'm saying? So you said that the objectives in Terraforming Mars, the dice game, were a little too easy, and they were claimed very, very early. So I assume you have the same objection to Trailblazers, right? Those goals are just way too easy. Yeah, too easy. Too yeah, easy. Yeah, yeah. The goals were foolish in Trailblazers. <laughs> it's like, you know, put down one red path. Hey, you know, I did that the first one. Like, we no. are being sarcastic here. When I, I remember when I looked at the goals for Trailblazers, I immediately knew that I could devote zero brain power to trying to achieve them because they were they were basically like goal the first grow 5 inches over the course of the of the playing time I was like eh, that's not going to happen moving on goal the second become a champion bodybuilder over the course of the next no no not happening on to the next it's just pfft. Yes, much like in our game, there you look at the goals and like that sounds not going to happen be like, <laughs> but one of them it was like you have to build a, a trail you during the game you're going to be putting out these three camps and one of the goals was to build a path that surrounded the Completely most surround, yeah. the most camps. And I thought, well, you know, that's ridiculous. You're not going to do more than one. And even that is impossible. And I said, well, th I guess that's it. If I do one and 
no one else is going to even bother because that's impossible. Then one's going to cut it, and and that's how it 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 it, it eked out. So I oh really? Yeah, that, it worked. Okay, it worked. I I, I I I surrounded my one camp. Nobody even bothered trying to do that. <laughs> Actually, I think one one tried, but but did not accomplish it. You have these really weird thin sort of path cards that you're putting out, and you can overlap them, and you're making these three different colored paths, all of which have to form a complete closed circuit back to their original camp of the same color. So people sometimes hear, you know, because I, I had the same objective show up or a similar objective show up in the game that I played. You had to completely surround a camp. It's like, oh, well, that's no problem. But then what that means is if you are to score any points with that other second camp, on top of the fact that just completing the circuit is going to be hard enough. But in order for you to be able to accomplish any paths related to that surrounded camp, you need the precise mixture of tiles that have the right colors such that the path surrounding it and the path of that camp can go through. Ugh, couldn't, I couldn't even begin to imagine the drafts I'd have to pull in order to do that. My hat's off to you for actually having succeeded, Walker. Yeah, it was it was, it was interesting. That's another game that it, it flows very quickly and doesn't overstay its welcome, and I'd gladly play it. Because I definitely want to see more of the goals that, you know, they seemed awfully silly. I think one was like the looping challenge. It'd be like uh, the most camps with three looping paths. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it was it, it's just they have <sighs> crazy goals, but I think they're, it's Wild. just meant that way. So, you know, if one person oh, and, does it. Yeah. And, and the people with a better sense of spatial uh, awareness and being able to complete spatial puzzles, it's this is absolutely their jam. You know, the people that go nuts for Calico and the people who go nuts for a lot of these pathing games, the people who not, not even just light tile layers, things like roads and boats and love figuring out these kinds of, whether it's infrastructure or pick up and deliver or what have you, those really intricate spatial ideas. Trailblazers is a remarkably efficient design, both in terms of use of components and in terms of rules. Because it really does let you focus on this daunting task that you've been given. The one that com- the ones that completely crack my skull open and scoop out my brains with a melon baller. Oh my goodness. So that was Trailblazers and Terraforming Mars, the dice game that we streamed. So we stream every... Saturday, and that's all we do. There's no dancing, no singing. We like to talk about games, but mostly we're just playing the game. And teaching it. And teaching it. And making fun of each other. As per usual. Yes. We got to play Argent Mansers of the University. This is an expansion to Argent the Consortium, a worker placement game by Trey Chambers published by Level 99 Games in 2015, which miraculously is almost 10 years old now. Fancy that. Time continues to march, even if you don't pay attention to it. it Such is the nature of things. Of course, as any good Kantian knows, time is nothing but an a priori intuition. But so that 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 their present oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, ba- hardly bears repeating. At any rate, I haven't played uh, Argent with the Mansus expansion for quite some time, but I decided to pull out because I'd forgotten how much flexibility the new orange mages give you. Because One of the great things about Argent is that it is a relatively elaborated worker placement game where the workers have different powers. And on top of that, you're just drowning in stuff. You can get supporters, you can get spells, you can cast the spells, you can get the items, you can use the items. Some of them are consumable, some of them you can use over the turn. Then there are these little clock tower things you're getting, and then there's... oh, It's great. I love it. It's all about timing as well. Yes. It's like I have these these workers that can't get hurt. I have these workers that attack. He's got workers that can attack. I'm going to try to, you know, uh, use all these items that you were talking about to sort yep. of pass time. These workers come out as a fast action. This spell allows me to put out another person as a fast action. And this this spell over here allows me to place a mage, and then I get to place the other mage that gets to dovetail off of the... Oh, look, I placed all my workers on the first turn. Which is probably a bad idea. What I was talking about is del- sure. delaying not to put out sometimes any Sometimes you want to delay, sometimes you want to be fast. I'm Absolutely. Gonna, I'm going to wait till Mark gets all his battle mages out, and then, <laughs> and then I know we can't at least use those to attack me. Now yes. I can put out my other mages and, and not have them destroyed. I do have a sincere apology for Mr. Trey Chambers, because I got one very crucial rule wrong. This is the first time I've actually played it wrong this way. This is a novel rules mistake, because and the, the part is... Uh, The the fault is definitely mine, but part of it is because Argent, for all its elaboration, is pretty simple to explain because a lot of the elaboration just comes in all the toys. And the way the toys work is relatively straightforward. The thing that I got wrong was I forgot that there's no such thing as passing in Argent the Consortium. The way that it works is the round continues until such time as all these cards get taken. And you can just take one of the cards as an action. You don't even need to be done. You can have 17 workers left. Well, not 17. 
you could have more spells to... So every time you do a thing, you're giving up some other things that you could be doing. Unlike a traditional worker placement game, and I've got nothing wrong with it, nothing against them, where it's just, well, we keep going until everyone's placed our workers. No. Do you want to place a worker? Do you want to cast two spells instead? Do you want to cast a spell and use an item? Do you want to place out five workers by virtue of some... All of these things are, are eligible. Now... And then you can put time pressure on your opponents when you play correctly, which like a doofus I didn't do, whereby the person who put out their five mages starts taking these cards to end the round. Meanwhile, these other people with 17 spells and five treasures haven't even put out any workers yet at all. It's almost like we play like five new games a week or something, Mark. No, this is pure, this is just purely my fault. I just I it's one of those areas where, and this is not me making excuses, but there are so many worker placement games, and in terms of round structure, so many of them are so very similar. You keep going until such time as you pass. There's no passing in Argent. And that's one of the things that makes the time pressure so interesting. Even played wrong in the way that we did, which I do not recommend. This isn't one of those things where, like, well, I think this is a good variant. No. But even when you don't have that further element of interesting tempo, there's still interesting tempo in Argent the Consortium, as Walker has explained. I do, uh, uh, necessary caveats, I do think that you should play with a, uh, a set of rooms that gives you a lot of marks, because the victory conditions for Arjun the Consortium are controversial. There are members of the Consortium, ten of them, eight of whom are secret, and you put out marks to discover who they are. If you don't put out a lot of marks, the end game is going to look super arbitrary, because effectively it is. You don't know whether you should be going for spells, or money, or treasures, or items, or supporters? If so, what color? I don't know. So you have to find out. And there are a lot of room setups. There's a lot of variable rooms involved. Like many level 99 games, the design approach is very much more is more. And sometimes I'm definitely in the mood for that. There are some room setups where there's just not enough marks to be had. I do not enjoy Argent nearly so much in those contexts. But I always play with a setup where, there are, uh, where getting marks is not trivial, but they're always available. That is the way I like to play. And I also like to play with the uh, the Summer Break expansion, which ramps things up. Because if you don't play with the Summer Break expansion, I I'm happy to play without it, but I prefer with it. You start with a very small number of workers, and what that does is it allows things to go quickly, and it also means that the aggression gets to ramp up. Because at the beginning of the game, there's so much room, and you don't feel the need to blast off somebody's face. There was a key moment a turning point in the game, Walker, I could see it happening. I'm very glad that it happened. Where initially when uh, you had your face blasted off a couple times, you seemed to be somewhat reasonably offended. But then you kind of shrugged and said, oh, well, this is the game. And then you started blasting other people's faces off too. <laughs> and there's usually that turn that happens in uh, playing Summer Break. If you're not playing with the Summer Break expansion, that turn tends to happen in the third worker placement of the first round. And some people don't necessarily want a full 90 to 120 minutes of unchecked aggression in their worker placement games. Some do, and that's great. Anyway, I really enjoy Mint Argent. I like it with Manchester University. I do have a couple of caveats. I like to play with certain room setups. I do like to play with Summer Break. But I think the fundamental design chops are really interesting, even in the configurations that are not my ideal. And I am very, very happy to put it in rotation. What were your thoughts, Walker? All right. I liked it. I've played it multiple times. I enjoy it. Even though you don't sometimes don't have enough marks, you can still sort of play towards, you sort of know that there's going to be, have the most of everything that's sort of available in the game. <laughs> and you can sort of gamble. And that might be an interesting way to play as well, right? Just yeah, not, Some people do prefer right? that, yeah. Where you can just sort of, I'm going to get a bunch. I know I played a little heavy and I think both the other players, other than you, looked at you know, one, two or three of the cards and just played towards those and then forgot about the rest or didn't worry about the rest. I mean, in fairness, I should stress that number one, two of the support, two of the members of the consortium are always face up. One of them has had the most influence. Influence is the closest proxy to victory points that Argent has. It's not a very good proxy, but when in doubt, get lots of influence is not a bad call. And I have seen some players not pay a whole lot of attention to the consortium and just rack up as much influence as they can. And then the other face up member of the consortium is have the most supporters. And given that supporters are A, valuable in and of themselves, and B, there are lots of other members of the consortium that care about supporters indirectly in a variety of ways, if you just pursue those two single-mindedly, you will probably do okay. But that having been said, it's not a great feeling at the end of the game if you played a two-hour worker placement game and you're, you're kind of a 
if you're a competitive mindset, which none of us are, but whatever, and two or three consortium members get flicked up that you didn't mark that strike you as totally out of left field, some people react badly to that. True. That's all I have to say. I I think I should make a bigger effort to get Argent back to the table again. Dewey enjoyed it, and Dewey's common complaint is, that was great, now I'll never get to play it again. <laughs> And so I, I'm keen to introduce Dewey to the game properly because I feel very, very bad that I made this mistake. Yeah, I'm, as soon as you said, I remember some strategies of like doing the one main action that, I, that yeah. I knew I had to do in the very next action, taking one of those cards. Yeah, just to put someone under the exactly. gun. Exactly. Just yeah, to it's add like, the pressure to that yeah, round. Yeah. yeah. I have the shallowest bench and or somebody else has a ridiculous combo engine, but it takes time. So I might as well just threaten. <laughs> yeah, right. absolutely. Yeah, Ar- Argent gets a lot of things right. I think it's uh, it, it was a really, really, really interesting design. Uh, ahead of its time in a number of ways, and uh, a really impressive work. I can't wait to see the redesign of Trey Chambers Harvest that was on Kickstarter recently, because uh, he's already done the super elaborate uh, worker placement game. I would like to see him now do the super minimalist worker placement game. I've never had a chance to try it, and I'm looking forward to trying it in its new digs. So that's Argent, specifically with the Mansers of the University expansion, designed by Trey Chambers, published by Level 99 Games. The expansion is sadly super out of print, and I needed. it took me a while to track down the second edition expansion, because the first edition had not particularly functional components. Anyway, published in 2015. So there's ways to play board games online, Mark. And one, whoa, of, whoa, whoa, one whoa. of the places is definitely not called... You board mean the same place where the kittens are? Yes. Okay. Definitely not p- called Board Game Arena. No. And they definitely don't have like an alpha testing place that they bring up board Well, games. because number one, you would only plug a service if they were giving you money. Exactly. And number two, you wouldn't talk about an alpha release because they probably wouldn't want to advertise something before exactly. it was ready for prime time. Just so. And okay. They, and they definitely... Don't have a game called Planet Unknown, which we very much enjoy. This is designed by Ryan Lambert and Adam Reichberg and put out by Adam Apple's Games. And I've played several games of this this week. Uh, you can, uh, they have a bunch of optional ways to play. The, you know, the option where it just turns one every, every round as opposed to the person, uh, picking. Uh huh. So that this game has a giant. Why would you want to remove that choice? Uh, well, when you're going, when you're cycling through a bunch of games, it just takes away that one extra choice. It's like, okay. here are the two shapes, pick it, put it on, next player's turn, right? Okay. So, you, so it's just, it, it makes the game just go that much faster, especially when it's only two players. I can see where if you're playing multiple players, you definitely want to, you know, manipulate the wheel. But with two, it just seems to make more sense. But okay, I digress. And uh, has all the different uh, maps, all the different uh, factions. Corporations, yeah. Played several games. They did a great job. No errors. Very much enjoy it. Planet Unknown. Question. Has it has this digital adaptation made you less inclined to play the physical design? Because sometimes this is this is the danger, right? You play the digital version, it's so much faster and it removes all the upkeep, and then you don't want to return back to the original version. No, no, no. Way. Okay. The original version is just so much better. You got the lazy Susan, you're playing the tiles. That's true. You actually see the people at the table. <laughs> you see how terrible job they're doing. You, <laughs> you get to look them in the eye yeah, when you yeah. call them incompetent. Exactly. Yeah. yeah All yeah. of those I hear things. You. I hear you. And you, you look at their board, oh, they really need that shape. Watch how I spin this and oh, all, yeah. <laughs> I'll take that shape. And it's not as though my intuition would be not having played the adaptation. But even if I had, I wouldn't talk about it, of course. But I would, I'd be hard pressed to imagine the physical version being obsoleted because it's not like the physical version drags or takes a lot of time or is particularly involved in terms of set. Now, shuffling is a bit obnoxious. Shuffling yeah. the, the, the tiles about putting it all back is kind of painful, but not terribly. But the game, because of their simultaneous play, the game moves sufficiently quickly that it's it's definitely worth having the tactile experience of putting out your little moving your little rover. That's right. Just that's, so that's that's some fun. And that is. Planet Unknown. Walker. Yes. This is a stink bug. Uh, I don't think it was, Mark. Damn it. (laughs) We played Cockroach Poker. Once again, we returned to the game of Colossal Bullying by Jacques Zimet. And it was really cruel. It was, you know, what do you want? Like... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> uh, Cockroach Poker is a game of bluffing. It is a very, very, very pure game of bluffing. And the victory conditions, some people would call it a bug. See what I did there? Yeah. But I, I call it a feature. There's only one loser, and everyone else gets to win. And given that 
once someone starts losing, they become a uh, prey for everybody else. But what this does, though, it's, it's not purely a question of imbalance or the game steamrolling towards an inevitable conclusion, although there's part of that, which is good. You don't want uh, light party games to drag. But it, it provides further texture for what people might decide to feed to what, right? This isn't just something like repeated rock, paper, scissors, where it's just about pure outthinking somebody or trying to read physical tells. I'm not disputing that that is a skill that people can have. But if you're already sitting on two spiders and you know that your third spider might wreck you, and then someone looks over the table, smiles at you in a certain way and says that this is a spider, you know that something's going on. And there's just more texture and, and, and things going on for you to evaluate whether or not that's a bluff. On top of that, I would like to eval- I would like to ask you, Walker, to explain the way you manage your hand in a game of cock Roach poker because I, I believe it de- deserves some exposure. Well, I'm not gonna say how I do it, but I, I just never look at. My, <laughs> I just I just never look at my cards. I will I will just take a card <laughs> off the top and I will claim it as something. <laughs> That's not true. I think you're lying to me, which, which is very apropos. You look at your hand, you sort it, don't you? I'm not saying anything. I okay. Here's my perception of it. You don't have to say yes or no. <laughs> my perception is that Walker looks at his hand, he sorts it, then he puts it in a face down stack in front of him and never looks at it again. So basically, it's like a combination of cockroach poker and this is not a hat, which is somewhat appropriate given that they're very similar games in a number of ways. And Louis this time, not the Louis I was talking about before, but the different Louis who also played Louis the Fourteenth, many Louis decided to copy you. He spread out, although he spread out his hand in front of him, and he wouldn't only ever take the top card, he would take cards from the middle. He seemed to remember what all the cards, it was It was impressive. What can I say? I, I play the normal boring way. I look at the cards in my hand as I play them to make claims about them, either true or false. And we had some epic plays of cards being passed without even looking at them. That was... Okay, so the, the most epic play was as follows, because when, when you hand someone a card, you can chicken out. And then look at the card and then pass it off to somebody else making a different claim. Instead of just calling the bluff, you can say, pass the buck. The, the, the true power move in cockroach poker is to not look at the card, pass it off to somebody else, and make a contrary claim, which is necessarily, but therefore, arbitrary. What happened this time was <laughs> somebody passed a card to Dewey, claiming that it was a spider. Dewey does not look at it. Passes it off to Huey, says, now this is a cockroach. Huey makes the smart play and say, well, there's only a one in eight chance of it being a cockroach. You haven't looked at it. It's not a cockroach. It was a cockroach. I couldn't believe it. It was amazing. Dewey shall henceforth be legend. (laughs) That is cockroach poker. One of our favorite fillers. And those are the games we played last week. Now a brief break while we pay some bills. This week's episode is brought to you by HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. With HelloFresh, you get farm-fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Fall is my favorite season, but let us speak truth to power and proclaim that seasonality goes way beyond pumpkin-spiced everything. And with the chef-crafted recipes from HelloFresh, you'll get all the flavors of fall direct from the farm for peak ripeness that you can taste. Cooked in less time than it takes to get delivery. Between family, two jobs, reading rules, and playing games, you tend to fall into the same meals over and over again. Well, not with HelloFresh. And with 40 exciting recipes every week, HelloFresh has you covered. You can save money, save time, get to enjoy cooking, and eat better than some frowning lordly dude you need to impress, all with HelloFresh. Go to HelloFresh.com slash 50SoWrongGames and use code 50SoWrongGames for 50% off, plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash 50SoWrongGames, code 50SoWrongGames for half off, plus free shipping. And we're back! Now, on to the news and why it doesn't matter. Well, we've talked about a bunch of games. We're sort of now in the sort of, uh, they've announced all the games that are coming out, and now we just have to wait to get them. Yes. In the words of Louis XIV, après moi le déluge, and we're in the middle of the Louis XVI phase, where c'est moi le déluge. But there's one game that had been announced. It's called Haunted Lands. This is another Ludus Magnus studio, and very hit or miss for us. They did Black Rose Wars, well, one hit. (laughs) <laughs> many misses uh, maybe not many but yeah the rest but, of the misses uh, yeah. but uh, the artwork for this looks fantastic the whole production looks interesting you're sort of scaring away ghosts from the villages to keep them you're ghost-free. scaring away ghosts well, or repelling them oh, okay, however, okay. however you want to say and it looks interesting I'm waiting for more information on it but the artwork looks amazing so they can usually be counted on for that if nothing else exactly yeah, yeah. 
So a brief note before my uh, main note of the day. The brief note is we frequently get communication from listeners, which we absolutely love. And very frequently it's of the nature, have you covered this? When did you talk about this? You've mentioned this. When have you commented more? All of this information is available on SoWrongGames.com. You can search our episode notes, search for the name of any game, and you'll get immediately get a bunch of hits. On How is your hair so shiny? That's not a question where, where, you get. Where, where do you get no, those, that's not, those lovely fitted shirts? That's not. No, no. we don't get those questions no. oh. as, a, as a rule. And also you'll find some of the terminology that we throw around. You'll also find information about uh, about many of the people in the Swag Extended Universe or Swagoo. Anyway, it is all on SoWrongGames.com. If you haven't taken a look, there might be some useful information there. What can I say? And if you're ever curious as to whether we've covered a game before, go to the searchable episode notes. It will give you mentions of everything we've talked For about. For those who don't know, control F. You go to the searchable Absolutely. notes, hit control F. There's a place to type in what you're searching for, and it'll show you all the instance of, the, of that particular phrase or word that you are searching for. And finally, in terms of the news, I have been very remiss, and I sincerely apologize. I've had a lot on my plate recently, and I did not realize that we are fast coming up on Arkhipov Day. And I'm thoroughly ashamed that I have not been calling attention to it for weeks now. Arkhipov Day is on October the 27th. It is the anniversary of the day that Vasily Arkhipov saved the entire world. To make a long story short, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, there were commanding officers that give the issue uh, the orders for a nuclear launch against the United States, which would have provoked a retaliation, which, according to no, no less than Robert McNamara, would have destroyed the entire world as we know it. And only one man refused to comply with that order and therefore scuppered the plan, and that was Vasily Arkhipov. He saved the entire human race and therefore deserves some recognition. So... Please join me in celebrating the heroism and basic moral decency of Vasily Arkhipov on October the 27th. Arkhipov Day. That is the news, and as Walker would say, why it sometimes matters. Now on to our feature game, which is Zuvatis. Zuvatis was designed by Reiner Knizzi and published by Bitewing Games this year after successful crowdfunding. This is a reprint of a 1992 game originally published by Hans M. Gluck called Quo Vadis. I will have some complaints about the, the retitling later. And we usually give a capsule summary of past works by the given designer every time we talk about Reiner Knizia. You basically have to pick a couple year spread in order to talk about his stuff. And in terms of the 90s, oh my goodness were the 90s good for hobby gaming by virtue of Reiner Knizia. So in 95, he published High Society and Medici, two excellent very, very efficient auction type games. Medici getting a reprint as well? Medici year? has been reprinted 17 billion times, and all, Medici deserves to be perennial, perennially in print as far as I'm concerned. And uh, Modern Art was also uh, published in the early 90s. The late 90s, I, dare, I defy anyone, including the exalted David Thompson, to have a three-year spread that were as productive of Reiner Knizia when he produced Raw Through the Desert and Tigris and Euphrates, all within a few year period before the turn of the century, on top of a whole bunch of other designs that he published. Anyway, Reiner Knizia. So, Walker, why don't you give us an unhelpful summary about what one does in Zoo Vadis? So in Zoo Vadis, Mark, I think, I think the peacocks are having a party. <laughs> all right? All right. So, so they, get to go, they get to go for free. Yeah. But the other animals, there might not be enough room. And the zookeeper, he wants to go, but he feels awkward because he's not an animal. <laughs> so he, he is an animal. He's a non. He, he's, he's, he's just, a, just he's letting the animals animal. out of their cages and through whenever. Like he's sort of like scooting them by with the VIP passes. He's a guilty thing. bouncer. He's hoping that they're going to bring him along. Oh, right? oh, okay, he's okay. To get their favor. You guys, can I understand. Go along for free. Just bring me with you. And yeah, get... <laughs> all right. Yeah, and so. And so there's these little meeting rooms where it's sort of like Big Brother. You sort of have to like vote whoever's the coolest onto the next level to try to get to the peacock party. <laughs> Is that how Big Brother works? I think so. Okay. All right. <laughs> Zuvatis. <laughs> Zuvatis. So originally uh, it was uh, Roman themed and it was called Quo Vadis. Quo Vadis is usually very pretentiously translated as uh, Whither Thou Goest which, quite frankly, I, I don't have a whole lot of time for. But it, what it actually means is, how are you voting? It was, a, it was an expression used by senators to, to ask how they were going to vote. And now it's anthropomorphic animals, like everything else is now. And so now it's zuvatis, which doesn't mean anything. So yeah. it's a combination of an old, La uh, old Roman saying uh, with zoo. So, okay. I mean, I guess it's communicated enough. It's, it's a retheming of Quo Vadis, but with zoo animals. So whatever, zoo Vadis, fine. 
Uh, and I will say this, though. The art by Quan Chai Moria, in terms of the anth anthropomorphic animals, these are the best anthropomorphic animals I've ever seen, and that includes Root, quite frankly. I'm not saying that overall, you know, they're both different products in their own way, but in terms of giving personality to the animals in terms of their, their, their actual species, I defy anyone to find a superior hobby gaming anthropomorphic animal than the marmosets. The marmosets are utterly epic making. I think the armadillos are also almost as great. There's rhinos, alligators. Or crocodiles, I believe. Crocodiles. Oh, fantastic. It's really, really well done. And it's a game that you can play up to seven players. And I think it would play up to seven players very well. And those are hard to find, especially in the time it would take. Yes. And the setup is almost instant. It's put out a couple tokens and you're ready to go. Absolutely. And the and the explanation is just short. The rule book is only 10 pages long. And like most Reiner Kinsey games, there are very simple actions to do. And I and I'm, I'm and I think that leads to why Zuvadas is such a good game. Because the teach is quick and it all makes sense. And because the players from round one need to understand sort of the weight on how they're voting. Like, you know, it'll be calling the question, you know, almost immediately, you know, vote me through. And like, well, what does that mean? Right. In yeah. a lot of games, you have, you have no value to put to that. But since the rules are so nicely, you know, laid out and so easy to teach, they understand exactly what that person advancing to that spa next space means and sort of what it's worth. I allow me to, well, I think we fundamentally agree, but I don't think that that's necessarily the best way to put it. They understand the parameters of what that means, but the overall consequences of what that might mean are fundamentally unclear because Zuvadis is going to end at a known point, but when that point is, is uncertain, right? You know the conditions under which the game is going to end, but it can end very precipitously, and you don't know what's going to cause it and when. Before someone has reached the end of the board, you don't know what advancement is worth. After they've made it to the end of the board, you still don't know how much, how far they plan to advance. Anyway, the, the parameters are uncertain enough that there's enough room for ambiguity because let me contrast this with another negotiation game that is of comparable rules weight and comparable duration, but I do not enjoy very much, and that's Chinatown. Because in Chinatown, the value of a given property is very, very calculable. The, the, the amount of play involved in what something is worth, especially in the later rounds, is not sufficient to make trading interesting, right? It all just becomes a calculation. Well, it's going to be worth six grand to you, so how about I pay you three and we both pocket the three? There you go. We're, we're done. And you can do those kinds of transactions in, in Zuvatis, but with always the patent of uncertainty because you don't know exactly what deals are worth. It's true. Let me just give a quick, a real explanation so people sort of can place what we're talking about. What you're doing in Zuvatis is you're sort of funneling through all these different paths and you're trying to get to the final chamber with your pieces. And there are limited spaces. And as soon as that last space in the final chamber is filled, the game will immediately end. And they can fill with player pieces and the peacocks can also fill spaces. And if you don't have one of your pieces there, you cannot win. It's sort of like Gugong. If you're not in the final area, you cannot score. And getting from the starting track to the end is going to get you some points. Making all these deals is going to make you points. Voting other people through is going to get you points. And then once the game ends, as long as you have a figure in the end, it's whoever has the most points will win. Leading to our discussion last week about whether you would rather lose by virtue of not getting to the end or whether you would rather lose by virtue of getting to the end and not having enough points. And again, I I don't think there's a right answer there. A lot of people have different reasons. I double-checked the original rules for Quo Vadis. It too is silent on whether or not the two victories are, the, the two losses rather, are equivalent or uh, to be differently weighted. I think that living in that ambiguity is perfectly reasonable. It's further grist for negotiation. And I think it's worth mentioning at this point the differences between Quo Vadis and Zuvadis. So in Quo Vadis, there, uh, it only played up to five. There was no six or seven player board. And the Peacocks uh, were not present. And so consequently, there was less uncertainty about when the game would end because the Peacocks ending the game is very common. Um, 
at least in our playings, partially by virtue of the fact that peacocks can advance without complicated deal making. You just do it, and it happens. There's nothing that anyone can do to stop it, really. If you're if you're fixated on doing it, although of course you can ask to be bribed to not do it. <laughs> Again, grist for more negotiation. And the other major difference is that now there are player powers. But like one of our other favorite negotiation games, Senji, your player powers cannot be used for you. They can only be used by somebody else. So in other words, it's something of value you have, but it's only a value if you trade it away, which again, gives you more impetus for negotiation. Far too many negotiation games don't give you enough impetus to negotiate. You're inclined to just go your own way. Uh, you know, the, the rate at which even a good Catan player will fund their own ex, uh, th their own proceeds is too high for my tastes to make it a true negotiation game. There are games like uh, Empires where, again, everything is so scarce, there's no room for negotiation. But in games like Senji or Zuvatis, if you do not use these for other people, they're of no use. And so it's the game is showing you the path, not telling you how to do it, but definitely getting you out there in an effort to make you negotiate. Yeah, and I think they did a great job because the player powers are so different. Uh, they can combo off of each other. Uh, they give points back to the player that gives the 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 power. Most of the time, yes. Most of the time, they're worth certain, and there's just sort of a balancing thing because all of the powers aren't exactly balanced, but some of the powers give points back to the owner. So I I think it's very interesting how they did that. You get two uses of it. There's some tokens that you could pick up that will give you a power back, but it, they're great negotiation tools and very interesting gameplay. And it's weird how easy it is, again, within a very, very simple rule structure, to end up with these multivariate deals. It's like, okay, on my turn, I do this thing, and then next turn, you do this thing, and then Huey on his turn. And so despite the fact that it's a very, very, very straightforward rule set, all the complexity comes from the players. All the complexity comes from the wheeling and dealing. And I was completely unprepared by how much nuance these player powers introduced and how much grist for negotiation, the complexity of the deals that arose. I was thoroughly impressed because we've been playing Reiner Knizian and reprints uh, and, and slight redevelopments for years. And I'm, I'm, I'm accustomed to them getting better. Like the Amun Ray 20th, edition, 20th anniversary edition is better than the original Amun Ray. But I, I have to say that this is probably the best Renner Kinsia redevelopment I've played in the uh, that I've uh, played in in memory. Agreed, and and the amount that the player order also influenced the negotiation was very interesting as well because you're more apt to make a deal with the person that's just in front of you because you immediately get to take your turn, or the player that's right after you because they immediately get to help you with what you just negotiated. Yes, especially since. If there are too many turns in between, there's the opportunity for other people to scupper what it is that you were planning to do. Just so. Because the location of the groundskeeper or the zookeeper is shockingly consequential. Sometimes you desperately want him uh, in front of your chamber, and sometimes you wish him all the way away. Well, I've decided that he's not a zoo. He's the zoo non-keeper. Okay. Because he does the opposite. He doesn't keep <laughs> the animals in the cages. He helps them get out of the cages. I think he is fundamentally senile. And he is kept around by the animals as a sort of pet. Maybe. Uh, that, 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 that's my kind of, and that's kind of implied, well, maybe not directly implied, the, the, the darker version. They say they keep him around of a sense of, uh, of fondness, but I, I think he's, he's kept around as, as a kind of pet. Because in order to progress along a path occupied by the, the, the zookeeper, or the groundskeeper, you don't need anybody's vote. It's automatic, but you get no points for doing so. Sometimes that is exactly what you want, and sometimes that is the last thing you want. It all depends. And so, like you said, the spaces and even the board itself is sort of like an interesting puzzle and, and leads to interesting gameplay because there are single spaces and because it's one space, you only need one vote. And so you can just progress up these single spaces. Because you can vote for yourself. Yeah, exactly. You vote for yourself and off you go. There are groups of five spaces. So then you have to negotiate three votes, which you could get yourself somehow. You could get three of your pieces in there. And you could even make it a point engine. You could throw three of your figures in there. And then if anyone needs to move out of there, they need all of your votes. So you're going to get two points just for the two votes. They vote for themselves. And off you go, plus any other points that you negotiated. So there's so many. The decision space is so big on on the different ways you can puzzle it out. Even with the, some some player powers that give you tunneling and 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 taking spaces where there's no space, like the single spaces, it is the... The Ibis gives the room Ibis. where there isn't otherwise. Yeah, which opens up all sorts of different things. 
The can I can I issue a historical complaint? Yeah, I don't think I could stop you, Mark. Fair enough. So I had some friends in Cambridge, great people, tremendous people, very very talented game developers, uh, for what it's worth. And they introduced me to a lot of games, and I, I value their friendship a great deal. They had a, a bit of a nasty habit, which I do not endorse, which is sometimes when teaching a game, they would teach it with their house rules and not flag that they were house rules. Uh, this is not uh, what we regard as, as pro-social activity in the hobby gaming, at least here at So Very Wrong About Games. One of the things, one of their house... Uh, furthermore, they had different approaches to house rules than I did. And actually, two of the games that I've talked about this week, they had variants that I did not approve of. One of them was for Louis XIV. They argued that they changed the scoring subtly, and they argued that it, that it, that it was strictly equivalent and better. And I engaged in a number of arguments to attempt to show them that you may it may be better for your purposes. It may even be better factually, I don't know. Uh, but it's not strictly equivalent. It, in fact, incentivizes certain tactics as, as opposed to others. I, I It took me forever to, to disentangle from their heads superior from changes the game state, right? And they finally conceded that it did indeed change the game state, but they acknowledged that the, but they still thought that their version was better. I was happy to reach that level of compromise. Then there was their variant to Quo Vadis. Their assertion was that in the Quo Vadis map, that, that the single office path, the one where you could advance by yourself because you have to advance a couple times and it takes a couple turns before you get into offices that give you points, that that, off, that, that path was fundamentally undervalued and nobody took it. So they, what they wanted to do was put points along that path. Like, this is the only way that people are going to pursue it. And I couldn't help but notice, I played Quo Vadis with them two or three times. Every time I played Quo Vadis with them, the person who won pursued that path. <laughs> And so I was like, guys, you're, you're, the variant that you've introduced, it, it seems to be deterministic in terms of the, the, I don't know what you're talking about, they would say. Otherwise, no one would pursue it. It's like, well, maybe, maybe not. But anyhow, <laughs> that is my historical grievance. Consequently, uh, it was, I've never played Quo Vadis by the printed rules. So I'm not really in a, co a position to comment much. My perception was, as I say, it was a lot drier and there was less grist for negotiation than the version of, of Zuvadis, but I feel that it's necessary to issue that proviso, as well as that illustrative lesson. House rules are fine. We're averse to house rules, but you can be pro-house rule, but please, flag it at least, so that people know what they're getting into. So that sort of dovetails into the Laurel tokens that you were talking about. So along the paths, except for the single paths, like you said, there are victory points, and these will add into your negotiations. Because they go anywhere from three to five. Two to five, actually. Two to five. And if there's a five pointer there, that means whoever goes along that path is going to get those five points. Oh, yeah. So guess what? That's going to get, that's going to be part of the, of the talk, <laughs> yeah. of the discussion. The, the well, let's talk. talk about this five point token <laughs> and how you want me to vote you through that five point token. And then there's always the backstabbing because you can move the, we didn't really say that when you move the groundskeeper to a path that just lets the animals through, he covers those tokens. Yeah. I think it's great. Yeah. <laughs> so on your turn, we didn't mean on your turn, you're either placing a new animal at the beginning of the path, you're asking to advance one of your own animals along a path, or you're moving a peacock, which will get you a point. And uh, when you're when you're negotiating, you can pay the peacocks, but they they don't like making change, <laughs> exactly. and they don't like carrying change. <laughs> so you can't give them singles. They only take you know. Uh, doubles are higher. Tokens yeah. are higher. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're pretty uh, elitist. But, you know, <laughs> so you, you can ask for their, you can buy their votes and they can push you along. And like we said, you can advance them so long along the track that they're going to start taking up those vital spots at the end of the track. And that, I think, is one of the uh, really interesting things in terms of tempo, because if you've already gotten to the end of the track, if you've got to what's called the star exhibit in Zuvatis, there are still lots of things you can do. But... If it's the case that the board state is such that you don't have a lot to do, you're not involved in a whole bunch of negotiations, and you think the game isn't going to last long enough for you to develop a new voting block, a new base of power, a new way to insert yourself in the consequential negotiations, you have something to do now. You can just advance the peacock or threaten to advance the peacock and ask people to bribe you not to advance the peacock. So you always have something in play because I, 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 I shudder to think it would be a strange game state where, where all the peacocks got their way to the star exhibit and, but the, the game still had significantly more time left to go. And at that point, so many people would be s desperately scrabbling to get to the end anyway. Yes. 
yeah, it, it also, despite the fact that, that Zuvatis is like a 30 to 45 minute game very often, it has a definite sense of escalation. The moment some, you know, people start out at the bottom, then a couple of people work their way to the top. Some other people are still probably stacking the bottom offices. Then someone starts making a push. And then the moment somebody gets into the star exhibit, everyone wakes up and like, yeah. hold on, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> it's marvelous. It, Tops off, please. Very, yeah, exactly. Very, very seldom do you get a game that short with that sense of a sense of oh, that much of a sense of escalation yeah and all i think this is great it's i think it's a really very good introduction to negotiation games because the the risk is not huge you know the it's not it doesn't have this grand scale it always you right. know it, it's all roughly it's a little focused a little focused and it doesn't take that long and the rules are very streamlined and direct yes and it's i think for our group just the right level of open. It's open enough that you can make multivariate, multi-turn deals with a number of moving parts, but it is sufficiently constrained that, I don't want to speak for you, Walker, but that you still feel comfortable engaging in the negotiation. You don't feel like you have to go out and bully people. There's enough structure that you can engage with it on its own terms, unlike a lot of other negotiation games that are not to your taste. Agreed. Well, there you go. I think this is squarely... Uh, a worthy entrant in, into our catalog of very, very approachable game for non-hobbyist gamers, but nonetheless satisfying for hobbyist gamers as well. Would you agree? Agreed. Well, there we go. Zuvatis by Rana Knizia, published by Bitewing Games. And that's going to do it for this week. Thank you very, very much for joining us. We appreciate the time you've decided to spend to hang out with us talking about some games. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find all our contact information at sowronggamescom slash contact. We read everything you send us. We'll get back to you if we can. We look forward to seeing you. Please do take care of yourself. Peace! And do celebrate a safe and happy Arkhipov Day on the 27th of October. You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigman. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time. And always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. <laughs>